So I am not fully vaccinated, and my wife will be fully vaccinated on Saturday. So we want to, if it's nice, go somewhere. It's been a long since we actually been in a restaurant. So remember, we don't go in, we'll probably go sit outside, but it just kind of like, everything, these outside activities in the summer might be okay. And at the same time, we have for India. So we got all kinds of stuff going on. Um, so we did the romantics, right? We finished the romantics, talked about romantic authors, and by the way, the parade will be all here. The park, all going to be parked in there, parade, and the people. And the plan is for people to drive by for walks and things like that. That's the plan. That's what I'm pushing for. Who thinks that's a good idea? Is that drive by growing? No, I think so, but I, I don't want to make it a big deal. I mean, you just. But people have to bring it up rock. Hey, so we, we just go there. We gotta call it a reverse parade because we can't call it a drive by because that has the wrong connotation. Good point. Good point. But, you know, you know, I was worried we wouldn't be able to have it just in case. We found a way we can do it, so it'd be weird. But what the heck? It's better than not having it. Okay. So then we get Italian nationalism. Did we get to this? We have just like just finished like Britain and France continue to chip away from our empire. Like just finished with the um Crimean War. But did we do and what about the romantics? Or did we do romantics on Yeah. I don't know. Did we get yeah. to the turtle? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I bet you weren't ready for that statement in class. <laughs> and we got to the turtle. Hi Timothy. Do we get to this? So unification will come out. Okay, so I thought we did. So let's get the unification. And these are the nationalistic unifying movements. We did the romantics, everything's good, we're on, all right. So we do a little bit of this. And so here's Prussia and Italy. And the implication is that they're going over there. They're going too fast for unification. So this is an anti-unification cartoon. But let's get to Italy first. This is, I think, it's Hungarian, but I'm not sure. So Italian unification. And Italy had young Italy. They were uh, they were uh, very much influenced by what happened in in beautiful. And I do mean beautiful Paris in 1830. But here are the national leaders. So this is the one I put up here now. We mentioned Garibaldi before, and we mentioned Mazzini of Young Italy. We mentioned King Victor Emmanuel. So these three we have mentioned, but the one we need is Cavour. And he was dumb, I put, I put him in the head, because I was, but he was like the brain behind it. And he was the prime minister of the Sardinia, Pipa Sardinia. He's the one who pushed him into the Crimean War. And his whole thing was, if we join the Crimean War, this will give get France and Britain behind our efforts to unify. So Giuseppe, he ran the red shirts with, with the fighters. Mazzini was part of the intellectual class who wanted the nationalistic kind of romantic idea. And Emmanuel wanted to be king of Italy. And so 1848, it failed. 1830, it failed. And so Crimean War. So these Mazzini and Garibaldi, Emmanuel had Cavour. He kind of looks like what you'd expect Cavour to look like. I'm just throwing that out there. But the one of the biggies was Pope Pius IX. Pope Pius IX had the papal states. Remember, the papal states was right in the middle of Italy. So this region right here. And they were basically uh, in power, in place, because of the French. And he didn't necessarily want Italy to be unified, but at the same time, if it was gonna, if it was going to happen, he wanted the papal states to be in some power position in it. And so he had the position because of his influence in being the center state to kind of push it either way. 
nobody was clear which way he wanted to go. I mean, sometimes he talked about Italy together. He was Italian. But at the same time, uh, well, let's make sure the people say the same power. So, don't forget the foreign influence, too. The Austrians control northern France, northern Italy, and the French have forces in Rome to reinforce the papal states. The French see it as the cap, they're the, the big Catholic now under Louis Napoleon, the big Catholic empire. You control that. So, here is. Garibaldi versus the French in 1849 when the French ran them out. Those forces with the red shirts. So it's that. The magnet for all the different groups organizing and wanting to unify behind Italy was Sardinia people. And we mentioned this once before, the, the Risorgimento. With Italian, you got out of and then people from Italy, these big Italian will laugh at you. But this resurgence of Italy. And so, here's eventually what it would be. Here are the papal states, Rome. There's also the Kingdom of Two Sicilies. And then this hodgepodge of states that were the nomination of the Austrians. So Italy really is a hodgepodge. And if you go there today, I mean, it is definitely different. You're, it's just different, it's culturally different, little differences all throughout it. Naples is, is crazy in many ways. I guess it's more further south, it gets even more crazy. No, don't worry about this one. So in step one, so step one is something what we've already mentioned before was 1848. Those were the big revolutions. They were put down. Garibaldi and Mazzini tried to uh, start a Roman Republic. The Pope was yes, then no, the French came in. But it set the stage, so it set like in the popular attitude of Italians. We can be unified. Then, this is then the situation, a little better map. Tuscany's great. Kingdom of Sicily. I guess Umbria is really neat. My, I have another nephew who lives right about here. So I'm an Italian nephew and a German nephew. I'm very cosmopolitan. And a nephew from Ohio. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Pretty amazing, huh? You got all the ends of the spectrum there. Mm -hmm. And a niece in Ohio, too. Next. So that's why Piedmont Sardinia is interested in Crimea. To convince the British and the French were allies, to give them credibility. Yeah, they kind of won and Sebastopol fell. But the point is, they're just trying to say, we're on the world stage. I mean, there's absolutely no reason for Piedmont and Sardinia to send 10,000 troops, and half of them died of cholera. Those poor men. And then, in 1858, in Plombier, which is in southern France, it's right about here. Actually, then it was part of Italy. Cavour and Napoleon met in 1848, 1858. And basically, Cavour was able to convince Napoleon to back. There's Napoleon, by the way, he's the Napoleon, right? Look at the mustache here, right? right? Back my play against the Austrians. Back him against the Austrians. And I'll give you land. I'll give you hunks of Italy, of the Savoy. I was just uh, hearing them. I just read a little bit in a travel story about Savoy right here. I guess it's just beautiful up in the mountains. Just like, just like shock. How pretty it is. And don't get me wrong, it's beautiful here, but the high mountains with rain is something else. And so with France on his side, and basically he gave France land. So land, which is now in eastern France, still part of France. Austria and Sardinia went to war. Austria and Sardinia went to war. And France backed Sardinia. Now Cavour knew that the Austrians were stretched thin, 
had to keep troops all over their vast empire. They just had a revolution, and it's only a few years before Hungary is going to uh, once again talk about breaking away. So with French help, they were able to defeat the Austrians. Took a big hunk of land, but look at this land they gave up to France. And they gave up a lot of land to France. Cavour is playing top real politics, power politics. It's basically saying, I'll give you this, you give me that, you were playing this game. He knows, I'll give up some land. There might be talk of getting it back. When Italy declared war on France in 1940 for World War I, part thing is they wanted that land back. Then France would get it back, and it's still part of France. So uh, Sardinia won. If there's a war with two names, war with two names in it, you always name the loser first. Right? So then Garibaldi. Now I couldn't unite with this. What he did is Garibaldi attacked Sicily and advanced through the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies towards Rome, knocking out the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. Garibaldi began this popular uprising, him and his red shirts. And Garibaldi is this flamboyant revolutionary with fiery red hair. If you go to Northern Italy, this part here is filled with redheads. I've never been to an area where I've seen more redheads in my life. And I've been, you know, England and Ireland, not even near as many redheads. Mini Butte. But other than that, Old Butte. Knocked out them and unified with Cavour. So basically, have Cavour. This scheming politician, scheming is not the right word, but plotting, planning, slowly organizing, and then this flamboyant revolutionary sweeps it in into northern or southern uh, Italy, and they unify. So they knock out the kingdom of two Sicilies. Cavour has this, so only this little hunk here is left. And then, while that's going on, Austria and Prussia would fight a war. Now this one. Is over this region right here, Saxony. And during the war, Sardinia sees their opportunity and they take Venetia, which is the province around the Venice. They're going to take that last little bit of it. And when that happens, you have Garibaldi getting the kingdom of two Sicilies, Sardinia scooping up this land and getting this last little piece. So you'll notice by 1880 or 1866, the king Sardinia is now basically Italy. We'll come to the King uh, Declaration of Italy in just a second, but you notice what's left? A rump papal states. And it's only there because of the French. So they take advantage of it. So Austro-Prussian War, who won? Yeah, Prussia won. And then in 1870, during the Franco-Prussian War, French troops have to evacuate Rome. Rome is taken, and Italy is unified. Step by step, power politics, ploys, scheming, backroom deals, revolution, war, that's how Italy became a country. The Kingdom of Italy in 1870, and who would be the king? Victor Emmanuel. So the king of Sicily, I'm sorry, the king of Sardinia, Piedmont, would become the king of Italy. Now, there would be a little bit of fighting as the few remaining French forces and the guard, the, um, the tiny force that would guard the papal state, most of them were uh, Swiss mercenaries. If you go to the Vatican today, the guards are they're Swiss. They purposely recruit Swiss guards, and they're dressed in these weird medieval outfits with assault rifles. So it's kind of weird. But they did storm the gate, one of the, the walled gates, into Rome. And there was a little bit of fighting, so they went back and reconstructed fighting here. So they could go back and act like there was a fighting. And they even took some additional shots into the wall to make it look like there was more fighting than there actually was. But Rome would fall, and Italy is re. Uni or Italy is unified because there had never been an Italy before. Remember, Rome was not Italy. That was the Roman Empire. And so the joke was 
Now, Victor Emmanuel's got the whole leg, and here's Garibaldi holding the, the boot. The boot of Italy and Sicily's the ball. Get it? Aha! Why? Why? Huh? That's just kind of weird. What? That. Well, my shoe's untied, and if the boot's here and Sardini's here, that's the hole. It's not that weird. It's a little weird. Okay. But Italy did not get all they wanted. And this is going to be called Italia Irredenta. And what Irredenta means is Italy still sees itself as a power that should have more areas. So, like, for example, I'm going to have to do the map now. Let's go back. Italy wants this, this place called the Tyrell is still Austria. Italy wants the city of Trieste right here, and Italy thinks all this coast, called the Dalmatian coast, was Italian. They, very few Italians actually live there, but Italy said this is part of Italy. And they also said they should get islands in the Aegean, maybe Corsica, which was French, but also parts of the Mediterranean. So Italy had grand goal, but the biggie here and down this coast. That's what they said. We that's part of Italy. They would be pro they would be promised that when they entered World War One. They didn't get it, and that would help lead to Mussolini. So that's Italy, Italia Irredenta. And here are all the leaders of the Italian Revolutionary Movement, and the ones we need to know. Here's Cavour. Uh, where did you see? Here's Garibaldi, here's Victor Emmanuel. Oh, there's Messini right there. And in 1871, it would formally be declared the Kingdom of Italy. And do you see the map, the flag? And what food came out of this? Pizza. Okay, there have been pizza going back to the Roman Empire, at least we know, you know. But the pizza as we know it, yes. And that is at a restaurant in Naples that said they blamed the first pizza. And it is, they just give you this pizza and a fork and knife. You know, we used to in the United States, they slice it down the street. If you get street pizza, then it slice. But if you order at a restaurant, they just give you a pizza. And uh, see, basil, green, white, mozzarella cheese, red tomato sauce. Which is pretty funny in a way that tomato sauce, remember, that came from the New World, part of the Colombian Exchange. But what the heck, right? So you just cut it. <laughs> and you can tell the, uh, um, American tourists, because we all try to cut it in slices. <laughs> and everyone just cut it in pieces. It's pretty fun. But back to France. Here is Napoleon III. Now, Napoleon III has made himself emperor. And he has all kinds of intrigue going on. He made himself emperor, got rid of the democracy. Give me one sec. I hope this is showing up. My computer is frozen, and that's... So, just one second. Just to review, in 1851, there was a plebeal side. Sorry, just to review. Now, that shoe keeps on coming on high. A plebeal side is a yes no vote. So, yes no. And the vote was whether or not Napoleon will become emperor. And he basically ran an authoritarian state from 1851 to 1859. The Falala laws, where these laws passed, are basically giving full power. They're essentially set to the press. There was an assembly, but very few people could vote. It was nothing more than a rubber stamp for Napoleon. <coughs> See, drink of water. Sorry. <coughs> a little bit of hay fever, which is a good thing, though, right? Things are things are hatching.
By the way, hopefully people younger than 16 will be able to get the vaccination very soon. And if you're 16 and over, please you get the Pfizer and all their openings. We can be back to relative normal. Because my wife did take the Pfizer, she got sick for exactly 24 hours. Sick. Sounds suspicious. And then immediately fine. I got the Moderna and my arm was ripped. So if God please, no. So after this though, he would begin to liberalize it. Napoleon had this vision that he would be a benevolent dictator in the a little bit like what Napoleon, his great uncle or his uncle claimed to be, and but a little bit of that kind of Voltaire benevolent dictator, benevolent monarch. That's what he saw himself as, kind of very Voltairean. And so here he is as an older man. So he kind of lightened up a little bit. Yes, he has the same. So they begin massive reforms on what we call the 20th century infrastructure. Back then, a better word would have been public works. Public as in the government began to rebuild cities, bridges. They totally redid Paris. In fact, we'll come back to Paris after this in the Epoch of the Bell period. But Georges von Haussmann, who was French, but he was in this region right here. There was a lot of Ger ethnic Germans in the Alsace region of France, and he totally remade uh, the streets of, of Paris, tearing down old buildings. Some had rooting people out of their homes for what they had for years, but they basically based France on a series of square city squares with streets radiating from it and so you have main streets and then these very confusing little streets radiating off the main streets i'm kind of used to a grid system where you have north south east west street so it's a little bit confusing but they also really push the idea of free trade and get rid of tariff barriers with the idea being is we can open up trade with britain open up trade with austria um, that will get them to open up their trade but that actually did not really happen and but one thing he did create was the credit mobilier the credit mobilier was a national bank that would loan money to businesses called the credit mobilier and the whole idea was to encourage business growth what napoleon is thinking france has uh but france is behind britain and the United States, but Britain's one they care the most about in the Industrial Revolution. So we're going to pump French public money, government money, taxpayer money through these banks in to, uh, into French business to create steel mills, to create manufacturing. It was partially successful. Yeah. So the U.S. wasn't really, I guess the U.S. didn't really have a, anything, I guess, stake in European politics until World War I. The only thing we had at stake was the fact we traded a lot with them. Okay. And so politics shouldn't matter about the tariff. And, but uh, the United States, for the most part, except for the War of 1812, stayed out. And I don't know why my font's so small, but they did finally allow for universal male suffrage and a little bit more legislative reform. So they started to form more of a constitutional monarchy. So he is mellowing as he gets older, but the idea being that the revolutionary movement had been curtailed. Had it been curtailed? Of course not. This is France. Uh, oh, and then this was a big reform. All education up to secondary ed, so in terms of high school, would be paid for by the state. So they set up a system of public education, an incredible reform. With the idea being that it is important for the state of France to have an educated, not only populace, to make rational decisions in their republic, but also an educated workforce. But the thought was too, if we can get them, if we can start education, maybe they'll be less likely to revolt. Oh, don't worry about. Oh, I should ask the syllabus of errors. He made an agreement with Rome and Pope Pius the Ninth, basically saying, "Sorry, we took all your stuff in the French Revolution." We okay on this? There's called the syllabus of errors, which, by the way, is a really funny name. Because syllabus implies almost like a, an educational plan. 
educational curriculum and errors. So basically saying the church made errors, France made errors. We're sorry. Did France give the church property back? Absolutely not. I was gonna say no. If you go to France today, every you can see all these amazing cathedrals to the smallest church, they're all owned by the government. And then technically the Catholic Church runs none. So uh, a couple years ago when the uh, Notre Dame Cathedral caught fire, if you remember, they just, just terrified this cathedral. And yes, it's still a Catholic cathedral, but it was owned by the government of France. Basically it's saying, well, we're not going to go back, but we can't, it doesn't make sense to be a, so don't worry, don't worry about censorship. It was like, I'm really sorry. Is it good now? Yeah, that's about it. Both sides won. But while Napoleon is becoming more liberal, at the same time, we have German unification. And German unification is really going to start portraying themselves as descendants of all these Germanic and Scandinavian myths. And so these are all representation of German myths. So the idea of trying to find something to tie the Germans together under one common myth. Yes, we're coming to arrogance. So remember, this is that Zilberin that uh, opened that uh, trade union that was 1834. So we've had this before. And, but it was more Prussian than it was Austrian. This, you can see the beginnings of German unification, right here. So they got rid of any trade barriers like taxes, uh, tariffs, customs, opening up trade. Kind of like what the European Union is now. And for reasons that can't really be explained, they can't explain it, Britain left that. But Prussia and Austria were a major rival. They both wanted domination of this Germanic area. This goes back to, uh, for Austria, to the Holy Roman Empire. But ever since Frederick the Great and the Seven Years' War and the War of the Austrian Secession, you have this rivalry. And going into the 1860s, Prussia was becoming an empire or a kingdom that could match the Austrian Empire. So there is a rivalry. There is the King of Prussia, King William, actually he's William VI, but he would become Kaiser Wilhelm the first. Yes, that's some facial hair. He's the King of Prussia. And he is basically, he was trained as a soldier. Every monarch, they all go through, every monarch has to be a soldier. In Germany, you can imagine that's even more important. They have to be a warrior king. But every place who has a king, or a monarchy, especially the males, they all have to go become a soldier. You know, look at look at Britain. They're the Prince of Wales, well, every all the heirs of throne had to be in the military. Just that's what you have to be. Well, but the real power behind Germany was the Chancellor. Now, Chancellor is the equivalent of the Prime Minister, the political leader, runs the day-to-day -day operations of the state. Chancellor Otto von Bismarck. And he was a master of real politique. To do whatever it takes to get your political goal. Deals, double dealing, backstabbing, putting one side against the other. As he saw, and his number one goal, German unification under Prussian control. So that he is going to be dubbed the Iron Chancellor. Chancellor. And he's going to say all of history is a matter of, all history is decided by Blood and iron. And this is an important concept because what does that mean? Industrialization and war. And Prussia had built this military state going back to Frederick William, Frederick the Great's father. And he would have come to represent Germany in real politics and therefore European politics in much of the 19th century. An incredible political figure. He'd be wrong about many things, but also make some incredible decisions. I got to say incredible. That would totally change Europe. And yes, he was named after the capital of Notre Dame. And so with that, I thought he was named after the capital. I was wondering. I said that. I was wondering if someone's like going really. 
No, the other way around. Okay, so lots of Germans, lots of German immigrants moved into North Dakota. Lots of them. So here's a couple of quotes, but you don't have to write this down, but a couple of the more famous quotes. When he talked about how political decisions down in seven, instead of parliament, have you ever seen this? Do you really want to know what happened? Do you really want to know how the sausages are made? And the answer is, not really. And if you ever made sausage, you know. There's a van. Where did you go? How did this move here? What was I doing? Oh, I know why. Couple more things, and we'll finish. That's one of my favorite quotes. If someone in power denies it, you know it's true. There's the blood and iron quote. There's got more quotes. After Germany became an empire, he's like, eh, what do I got to do now? Well, he finds stuff. This is a bad omen. If one generation is wrapped up, the next one will fight. And this, you can see a number of different times. Germany got beat up. Prussia got beat up in the 1840s. They come back in the 1860s. You see a similar thing in, in World War I in the 1920s. Germany got a beating, so they'll come back. And they got another one. Uh, but, but it was a cultural idea. And, of course, he predicted World War I in 1880. Some damn full thing in the bottom. So, Bismarck's policy. And it would be not the gap theory. And what that basically means is this. He will exploit the gap between those who want a parliamentary republic and those who want a monarch. He will exploit that difference and play off on them. He will play off on, the people, on that difference agreement. You'll see this a lot. In American politics, they'll call it triangu uh, triangulating. Trying to play in the middle and play both. And so here he is with um, the various different groups in Germany, and he's playing them like he's, he's the conductor. And all their power, he has muzzled them. It's kind of a clever, creepy ad. <laughs> and a couple more things. He also, understanding that if Russia is going to lead unification, they might have to go to war. He proposed an army bill that would dramatically increase the size of the army and the number of young men that could be conscripted into the army. Remember, conscription is the draft. So he's going to be to rebuild and modernize the army. And his whole goal is to build a pool of young men who have been in the army, and even when they're out, they're part of the reserves that can be efficiently brought out to beat the Austrians. He won't go to match the Austrians' numbers, but maybe he can beat, match them with better and highly trained soldiers. And then, begin a series of Prussian expansion. Slowly but surely expand Prussia, rallying people to the idea that Prussia is leading to unification. Seeing what he get away with, playing one side on the other, until he can unify the whole thing. And so, this is the German Confederation after the Continent of Paris. So here are all the Germanic states. So Prussia's in purple. And what they're gonna do is, at first off, way look at, okay, Austria dominates down here. And also, Northern Germany, by the way, this is low Germany because it's elevation, Northern Germany, mostly Protestant, Southern, mostly Catholic. And even though that wasn't as big in terms of like a religious war, but it was a big cultural divide. So Prussia was closer to here. In fact, it, was, it, it is noticeably different here and here. Yeah. So why didn't, so Prussia has the two pieces, right? Why didn't they just connect them in some way? Well, these are Hanover and other states that are independent. 
So if you connect them by conquering other areas, you get a lot of enemies. Mm -hmm. So he wanted to do it in such a way that he could, a combination of taking, conquering, but also he wants them to willingly join. Okay. So he's going to try to put one side after the other. There's going to be war, but hopefully not have to fight everybody. So the first step, number one, the Danish war. Thoughts about the Danish Prussian war. Who won? This area up here in the this peninsula is called the Jutland Peninsula. Schwelzleg and Holstein. Right here. He unified with Austria to win its independence. Both these two areas from Denmark. Now, what I mean win its independence, no, they're going to be under the domination of at first the Austrians. Now he unified with the Austrians. Why? By pushing this back will strengthen his hold here. I should add, this is still part of Germany now. But after World War I, Denmark got this. That's part of Denmark now. Unified with Austria and defeated the Danish in a sharp, pretty nasty war. But it scared the northern German states to either unify with Prussia and strengthen the tank. Unify, Prussia is a force, or see who unifies with Austria. See who says, no, we want Austrian help. Because he's planning the next step. By the way, this is the Austro-Prussian War map. This shows the Austro-Prussian War and the Danish-Prussian War. And it has easy to follow arrows, so you can tell exactly what happened. So you understand that completely. We're not quite to the whole, to World War I, where you have massive armies fighting across entire frontiers in the line. It's still big armies will march and fight one battle, like Napoleon, or for that matter, like the Civil War, U.S. Civil War. The Peace of Vienna, these areas would be independent, but now the battle lines are being set. Holstein is, they got a big hunk of Denmark in the Peace of Vienna. The battle lines are set. Prussia now is divided into northern states, pro-Prussia, pro-Austria. And then, what does he do? Just two years later, he turns around and tricks Prussia into going, or tricks Austria into going to war. The Austro-Prussian War. And on that happy note, we'll finish it tomorrow. So what do you guys, uh, let's look at the test. I'll talk a little bit more about it, but I'm, I still can't decide. I will let you know tomorrow. I might post it tonight. All right, good. Well, everyone, the review list for everyone at home, it is posted. <laughs> And I will see you tomorrow.